Hello everyone and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome to hashtag what the patriarchy where we are planning the destruction of the patriarchy from its roots. Thank you for joining me. I've been asked to introduce myself. I'm Shahnaz. I have a PhD in Islamic studies. I am currently an assistant professor of religion. In my last video, I said that I would talk either about menstruation or about Leila Ahmed's book. Um, we're going to talk about Leila Ahmed's book first because it will inform our conversation on menstruation and pretty much many other topics as well. So today's book then is called Women and Gender in Islam. Okay, Historical Roots of a Modern Debate. Okay. It's by Leila Ahmed, like I said, and it looks like this. It was published in 1992 with Yale University Press. And it's another classic in pretty much all things Islam and gender. Okay, It is potentially challenging, though, from what my students tell me each time that I've taught it. But I recommend it because it will challenge your views on Islam and gender, no matter who you are, Muslim or non-Muslim. And as the title indicates, it's interested in the historical roots of a modern debate, the modern debate being pretty much all things Islam and women and gender, uh, referring, for example, I think more specifically to the popular Western colonialist orientalist claim about Islam's oppressive treatment of women. Um, it's a history of the discussions, the writings, the conversations, the debates on women and men and gender more generally, and how these discourses change with time and how especially they affect women. So the book begins way back in history from ancient Middle East, Mesopotamia, Babylonia, Persia, and so on, and also ancient Greece and uh, Rome. And it covers some of the earliest archaeological, textual, legal, other historical data that we can find about how people lived thousands of years ago and how their lives and their attitudes continue to affect and shape our lives today as well. So Mesopotamia, of course, housed a bunch of different groups of people like the Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the Akkadians, and so on. I'm going to spend a lot of time on this history. The argument of the book, I think, can be summed up in several ways, or maybe they're all the arguments of the book. So one, the status, the position, the roles of women and men depend entirely on multiple factors such as politics, law, economics, society, and class. So that when somebody asks the question, what does Islam say about women? The correct answer should begin with something like, it really depends on what time period we're talking about, what class, of, what group of women we're talking about, what political environment, and of course, whose interpretation of Islam we're talking about. Another way to sum up Ahmed's argument is that the status, the roles, the position of women in Islam were relatively good during the Prophet Muhammad's time, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but gradually became worse as Islam began to be monopolized by certain individuals, men, of political and social influence and power. A third way to explain Ahmed's argument is that there's no such thing as Islam versus culture. You've heard me say this before, because it really depends on how we're de defining both Islam and culture. For Islam, for example, are we talking about the Quran? Are we talking about Muhammad and his practices or the Sunnah? Um, are we talking about the views, the beliefs, the practices of Muhammad's companions, the Sahaba? Or do we mean perhaps the opinions of the men who long after the Prophet Muhammad had died, wrote down things that he may or may not have endorsed. And these are men who eventually became known as the founders of the legal schools of, or the madhabs, right? The Hanafi, the Maliki, the Zaydi, the Jafari, and so on. And finally, the author makes the argument about the egalitarian ethos of the Quran being replaced gradually with a hierarchical or unequal teachings and practices of established, institutionalized, official Islam, what the author also sometimes calls orthodox Islam or establishment Islam. It's a kind of Islam that gets political and institutional support um, so it's able to become mainstream while the other, the non-official versions of Islam, don't have that kind of support, so they don't become mainstream. All of this to say that what even is Islam or what is Islamic or un-Islamic in the first place should be questioned. And Ahmed doesn't define the word Islam, but she distinguishes be between these various forms of Islam that are available to us, that have been available to us historically, such as the forms that never became major the majority or the dominant or the mainstream views, so when she says Islam does this and that, and I will be, I'll be doing the same thing, I'll say Islam does this and that, Islam picks up elements of patriarchy, for example, what we mean by Islam there is institutional Islam. This is the official Islam, the textual Islam, 
It's primarily men's Islam, men's interpretations of Islam. So the first part of the book is all about gender before Islam, and not just in the ancient, ancient Middle East and Greece and Rome, but also right before Islam, what we call the, the eve of Islam, so that we can trace what Islam picks up and inherits or what it rejects or modifies from these religions, from these regions, from these cultures and civilizations, and so on. Here's what happens, okay? Over the course of several thousands of years, uh, the Middle East goes through many different kinds of civilizations and groups and conquests, like the Babylonians, the, Assy the Assyrians, the Persians, the Romans, the Greeks, the Christians, and each group of people who conquers the Middle East will impose their own will and their culture and their customs and habits and practices, and sometimes their religion as well, on the conquered people, such that the indigenous customs, in indigenous cultures and habits and practices become so immersed with the conquerors that you can't really tell the difference between where where what a certain belief or practice originated and whose idea was what institutionalized islam picks and chooses from all of these empires all of these communities all of these regions and religions and practices and cultures that have become so immersed in, in middle eastern cultures throughout history by the time that islam is being established and my beloved viewers, this is precisely why there is no such thing as Islam versus culture. In the first part of the book, we're also introduced to the theories of how women's subordination probably became a thing. One theory is that it happened with urbanization. So archaeological and historical data show that women were held in esteem, in high esteem before urbanization, which began to probably, which begins probably around the year 6000 BCE. This gradual subordination of women is explained like this. The growth of urban centers around the year 3500 to 3000 BCE arises in Mesopotamia, which leads to military competitiveness, which relies on male dominance, which gives rise to a class-based society, which means that your temples are now class-based as well. And so as a result, the patriarchal forms of family becomes important because property heirs are important since we're now class-based, right? And sons are especially preferred, which means that paternity becomes to, begins to matter, which means that women are now seen as commodities, as producers of heirs, which leads to the controlling of female sexuality, and female sexuality itself becomes a sort of property, first of the fathers and then of the husbands, which means that female sexual purity becomes important because it is valuable property now, which means that the patriarchal form of marriage, right, by which we mean one husband for one or more women is important. Women's sexuality can be available to only one man, her husband, or her enslaver in the case of concubinage. These strict ideas of sexuality in a class-based society lead to the decline of women's economic contributions and their status, which leads to the devaluing of pretty much all things female and feminine. What this means, though, is that patriarchy isn't, the, isn't inherent to humans and it's not the only way for societies to function because we've experienced historically other ways of being as well. What is always interesting to me though is this. Traditional Judaism is matrilineal, okay? That means that the identity of the child depends not on the father's identity as typically happens in a patriarchy, but on the mother's identity. And in order for a person to be considered Jewish, their, their, their mother has to be Jewish. Now, this isn't accepted by all Jews today, and neither does this imply necessarily that Judaism is not patriarchal or doesn't have any, any, any layers of patriarchy in it. But the point here is that there are other ways of thinking about lineage. Establishment Islam, for example, could have chosen this Jewish view that was available at the time that it was emerging and being established, but it didn't. So back to the book. Things progressively get worse for women with time with some exceptions. For example, you have the Hammurabi Code. We're talking about the year 1752 BCE, um, which is somewhat decent to women, protecting their status and everything. But you have Assyrian laws, which are later, we're talking around the year 1200 BCE, not so much. They were actually pretty violent to women. But even then, the Hammurabi Code, which was relatively decent, is not consistently good to women. For example, while divorce was a thing that was available and acceptable, um, it was far more easier for men than it was for women. Okay, now I want to issue a trigger warning because I'm about to talk about sexual violence. So if you need to fast forward to the next maybe 50 seconds to a minute, um, you may do so. In Assyrian law, rape was seen as damage done to property. Because remember, right? Female sexuality was the property of either her father or her husband's. Early Muslim male scholars totally thought of rape as damage done to a man's property. 
Okay, so in Assyrian law, if the woman if the woman who was raped wasn't married and presumably therefore a virgin, um, then the damage was done to the owners of the of this particular woman's sexuality. Her father, again, her father or her husband, and therefore she had to marry her rapist since you know the rapist had just stolen another man's right to sexual access to this woman. In ancient Middle East, besides this kind of an idea of uh, female sexuality. Polygyny, the idea of a man having multiple wives or multiple spouses, was totally a thing too, although it was very, very common and far more so among the upper classes, if not entirely in the upper classes only. Um, and veiling too was a common social practice and that was rooted actually in the idea of a respectable woman versus publicly available woman. Um, and this too, veiling too, was a thing only among upper class women originally. But at some point, and it looks like that's when the Byzantines are in power, Veiling becomes a norm among the non-elite women as well, and it was shared by the Christians. The, the practice of veiling was shared by the Christians, the Persians, the Mesopotamians, the Greeks, and pretty much all other Hellenic territories. Now, since the seclusion of women is related to veiling, and once veiling is adopted by non-upper class women as well, segregation and seclusion of women also gradually become a thing for free women of, uh, and, and women of all classes, as opposed to enslaved women, for instance. So enslaved women are actually not allowed, they're actually prohibited from covering. And this is a thing that earlier Islam picked up as well. The idea here, of course, was to distinguish between women who were perceived as sexually available, that is enslaved women, um, and those who were not sexually available, free women. I want to talk a little more here about veiling because it's one of the biggest points in the book. So you see, official Islam chose to keep the veiling, veiling practices of the previous religions and regions and cultures, and it becomes institutionalized. Veiling becomes institutionalized as more and more regions are conquered. Gender segregation was already practiced by, say, the Zoroastrians and the Christians, and veiling was already practiced by, again, pretty much everyone around the Muslims, right? So in Christianity in particular, veiling was connected to the, to the historical Christian view that all things sex-related are bad and shameful, and sexuality was a source of shame, and like patriarchies everywhere, it associated the female body and sexuality, female sexuality, with shame far more so than the, than the male body or, or male sexuality, and therefore it required women to cover their body in a way that it didn't require men. And then there's something really interesting that we can observe about what happens as, as these different, ca di different people are conquering the Middle East. You see, with Greek conquests outside of Athens, attitudes towards women change dramatically. So for example, when the Greeks are in Egypt, which is roughly around the 300s BCE, they notice that the Egyptians are pretty good, there, good to their women. Women are not um, legally considered inferior to men, and Egyptian law didn't require male chaperones or male representation or male representatives for women. And wife beating was literally legally prohibited and came with consequences for the man who was hitting the woman. But all of this changes as the Greeks gradually influence Egyptian society and attitudes towards women in, in, the, in the Egyptian society begin to lean more towards the misogyny of the Greeks. What is striking in all of this though, right, in, in all this cultural exchange that's going on, is that the good ideas and attitudes towards women are not being picked up by anyone. They, they're actually not the ones that are being spread, the bad ones are, the misogyny is being normalized and universalized. But at the same time, things weren't totally black and white, women did still own and manage property at various times in history, they could be priestesses, uh, they had all kinds of jobs like weavers, bakers, musicians, scribes, and so on. And divorce was permitted to women if it was in the marriage contract. Interestingly, Arabia, where Muhammad will be born soon, was the only part of the Middle East that where all kinds of marriages remain normal. Okay, Matrilineality was a norm in many tribes. Polyandry, the idea of women having multiple husbands or spouses, was totally acceptable. Polygyny, of course, was common too. And before Muhammad is born, pre-Islamic women did have sexual autonomy. Women actively participated in public and social life including in warfare, and paternity was of little or no importance because the child was viewed as a child of the whole tribe, of the whole community, not of the man. But this was all in the process of changing anyway, about, what, some hundred years before Muhammad is born. Leila Ahmed argues that women's position is not only constantly changing in society, but that the status of women during Muhammad's time and immediately after his death was relatively de decent, but it gets worse with time. You see, divorce and remarriage were extremely common for women during Muhammad's time. The Prophet Muhammad himself married only divorced women and widows, with one exception, right? And then, of course, from the Hadith, 
uh, recall that famous hadith of a woman coming to Muhammad saying she doesn't like her husband, that there's nothing wrong with him, he's pious, he's great to her and all that stuff, but she's simply not attracted to him. And Muhammad says to her, go ahead and you know, give him back the mahra he gave you and you're divorced. In fiqh, however, divorce is n close to impossible for women to get. Fiqh, again, is very, very heavily male-dominated. And women also challenged Muhammad, وسلم, they questioned him, they disagreed with him, they demanded their rights from him, and not just him, but also the, but also the Sahaba, right? His companions, male and female. Then, of course, there were the women of Medina who are notorious in the tradition for having been assertive and strong, something that the Khalifa Umar wasn't very fond of. He has a reputation in the hadiths, by the way, in the tradition as well. Um, for being aggressive towards women and for bringing some negative changes to Islam, like regulating and enforcing segregating segregated prayers, because in Muhammad's time, prayers were not segregated, um, stoning as a punishment for adultery. He even forbids the Prophet's wives from going on the pilgrimage, and he also didn't like when women went to the mosques. Uthman, the next Khalifa, however, later lifts the ban on the Prophet's wives' uh, hajj, and he also allows women, to, women and men to pray together um, in mosques without a barrier the way that we did in Muhammad's time. The point here is that the ground is being paved pretty darn well for where things are headed for Muslim women with in the coming centuries. Now, Islam as we know it is officially established during the Abbasid era, which is a pretty long period. We're talking the years 750 to 1258, for example. And this is where the strongest contrast seems to be present from Muhammad's time, especially in terms of things like marriage, women's religious and intellectual authority, and women's participation in, in public life, including in warfare. And the way that, that that works is that first, we have the early Abbasid era, during which we are transitioning slowly, heading towards the patriarchy. By the middle Abbasid era, androcentrism, or male-centeredness, is established in official Islam, okay? And by the later Abbasid era, near the end, for example, divorce for women is frowned upon, and both divorce and both divorce and remarriages are difficult to accomplish unlike the way that they were in Muhammad's time. However, and Ahmad emphasizes this, there were Muslim communities and Muslim individuals and groups at the time that Islam is being established during the Abbasid era, right? Who already are in, in disagreement with this orthodox Islam that is about to be established. Because it takes several centuries for, for establishment Islam to occur. These groups included, for example, the Sufis, the Kharijis, the Qaramita, all of whom, by the way, rejected child marriage and concubinage, and the Qaramita even banned polygamy and the veil. But gradually, over time, what happened is that the ethical message of Islam got lost because those who espoused th this ethical vision of Islam from the Quran and the Sunnah did not have or maintain any political power and influence the way that the patriarchy did. And Ahmad shares here a lot of really interesting and, and depressing anecdotes here that illustrate very well how this gradual change is occurring. One of these anecdotes is that Abbas, who is the founder of the Abbasid dynasty, uh, married a woman who proposed to him, Um Salama proposed to him, and he accepted, and she married him on the condition that he will not have any other wives or, or any concubines during, the li during their marriage. And he sticks to that promise, but people are mocking him the whole time for listening to a woman and for not taking advantage of the rights that God had given him, like polygamy and um, having concubines. And anytime our girl Um Salama uh, hears people making fun of him for that, she has them beaten up. And then his successor, Abbas's successor, um, marries a woman named Um Musa, and she also has stip stipulated in their marriage contract, in their nikah contract, that he was not allowed to take any wives or any concubines. But homeboy really, really wanted other wives and concubines, but he just couldn't break the contract, right? So what he does is to try to seek a fatwa or some legal Islamic opinion from some scholars or some judge to allow him to go ahead and break the contract. But our girl Umm Musa was smart and had connections, and anytime she would find out that her husband had gone to some other judge or scholar to get a new fatwa from, from them, she would send presents, she would, she would bribe these judges with gifts and presents so that they would make a decision in her favor, and they did. But when she died, he pretty much immediately got like 100 concubines. So during the later Abbasid era, women are largely absent from the public. The patriarchy that's been picked up from these, from these cultures, from the cultures and regions that were being, being conquered, gradually becomes a part of the written official Islam. Oh, and an unacceptable patriarchal fact, by the way, 
the Abbasid ruler Harun Rashid, who is for some reason very, very famous and everybody loves him because supposedly he was all into intellect and science. But as male intellectuals tend to be insecure in their masculinity and therefore misogynistic, he had hundreds of concubines. See, that's the thing about history. When people say that the Abbasid era was a golden age or the golden era of Islam, golden for whom? Obviously, they mean in terms of scientific contribution, Muslim scientific contributions to the world. But at the same time, it was pretty cruel to women. And it's just like the Enlightenment era, okay? The European Enlightenment era, the, the men who are given credit for setting into motion the Enlightenment and for introducing their supposed enlightened thinking to the world were actually deeply misogynistic and incredibly racist too. Women's rights, you see, can always wait in all intellectual movements. So the bottom line here is that androcentric Islam becomes established textually during the Abbasid era, but even then there were cracks of ethical and egalitarian versions of Islam and visions of Islam that show that alternative forms of Islam that are not misogynistic have always existed and they are always possible. So there's hope. In medieval Islam, which is roughly the 15th to 19th centuries, we find that the lives of women in Syria, Egypt, and Turkey, which is what these particular chapters are about, are relatively similar under the Mamluk rule. The Mamluks rule around 1250 to 1517, okay? And their living conditions depend pretty much entirely on their social and class conditions. A lot of murders during this time, by the way, uh, because apparently women didn't like sharing their husbands. But also, it looks like during the Mamluk rule, women are back to marrying and remarrying a lot. Some women literally remarry four to five times in that one lifetime. So we seem to be shifting again, right, to closer to what things may have been like during the Prophet's time. Women are also owning and administering and managing property. Um, they have all kinds of jobs. Uh, the upper class women are also even investing in trade and making loans at interest, by the way, especially to their husbands and other relatives. Uh, women scholars did exist during this time, although I will say that women scholars have existed in all period of, uh, periods of Islamic history. They have also always had male students and male teachers, but at this time in particular, women teachers are not paid. The salaried positions um, as teachers were available to men only. And now we're in the 1800s. Um, in Egypt, where we are starting to see the debates on women's education, should girls be allowed to learn at all, to go to school at all? And once it's established that they can absolutely learn Islamic education, the, the question becomes, okay, what about secular education? And there are all kinds of responses to these questions, some saying yes unconditionally, um, some saying no unconditionally, and others saying yes with some conditions. By the 1890s, however, the answer has become an absolute yes. Girls should be going to school. They should be getting secular education. Uh, women now have their, their own publications, a whole literary culture that they are participating in, um, in, enabling their participation also in larger political debates that are happening in their country. In 1882, white people start to occupy Egypt and, you know, white dudes have a lot of opinions on women's bodies and lives and my goodness, the way that they fixated on the veil, okay? Emotional and all as they are, uh, they're not thinking logically, so they're like, whoa, this veil thing is so oppressive and this is so degrading and so terrible and lonely and miserable and so on. So, of course, Egyptian men react to emotional as men tend to be, like we just said. And so some are like, whoa, you're right, my dudes. Oh my gosh, this is really oppressive. And others are like, go to hell, white people. And others are like, hmm, how about we compromise? Now, these white people are extremely hypocritical, okay? It's not like they ever really cared about women's rights or Muslim women's rights. And there's a lot of scholarship written on this that I'll talk about some other time. Um, but for now, the British dudes still, for example, viewed women as the property of men, of their fathers or their husbands. Women weren't allowed to do anything on their own. They weren't allowed higher education. They weren't allowed to vote. I mean, there's a dude named Lord Cromer, okay, and who's, who's a British colonial administrator. He shut down British women's demonstrations um, as these women, these, these British women demanded the right to vote. But then he's going to go into Egypt and like have the audacity to tell Muslim people how to treat women. Screw you. Like, screw you, man. And to be clear, again, he didn't want rights for Egyptian women either. Egyptian women literally fought this guy to allow them to even go to secondary schools. Colonialist feminism becomes a thing during this time, you know, when you're a feminist, but in the interest of colonialism and your feminism is founded on hypocrisy like the, like the feminism of the dudes, the British dudes um, in this time as well. 
We then learn about the activism of Egyptian feminists. They didn't all agree with each other, of course, on what was good for women, on what it meant to be feminist, what it meant to be, egal what it meant to be egalitarian. Some feminists from this time in Egypt are Malak Hifni Nasif, Huda Sharawi, uh, May Ziada, Safiya Zaghloul, Nabawiya Musa, I love her name. And they're all participating actively in the intellectual and political conversations around Egypt at this time. On gender issues, of course, they were speaking from personal experiences with the patriarchy so that they knew what they were doing and also there was something at stake for them in all of these conversations, whereas for the men, as often happens, the participation in these kinds of debates was merely an intellectual exercise. The rest of the book discusses the political atmosphere of Egypt in the 1900s and how it informs and is informed by conversations on gender in the country. There's a lot of focus on, on the different feminist visions and also on the veil, who wears it, why, how it gets revived, where, and so on. I'm going to stop here because I think you get the idea. Read the book. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you all next time. Salam.